morning. It's morning here. I don't know what time it is where you are or when you are. It could be the afternoon, the evening. It might be dusk. It may be dawn. It doesn't matter. It's conjecture time. We're back. I'm not going to ramble on about the same old, I wish I did this more frequently. I'll do it when I do it. Okay? Okay. I got another episode in backlog, so that's good. It's like the first time I've had two episodes ready to go, so after this episode, there will be another one within a couple weeks here, for sure. So I'll keep this intro pretty tight, but there are just a couple ideas I wanted to share, a couple things I wanted to put out there. I was talking to my wife yesterday, and I just had this this little revelation. I, I tend to, I like to sit back and, and look at the big picture, try to take yourself out of the picture and make it not about you. I try to do that sometimes. And I was thinking about, like, who are we? Who, who are you? And not just to yourself, but to other people. And the answer I came to is we are the feeling. We are an essence that other people feel when they think of you or when they're around you. Hear me out. So... I'm lucky in that I still have both of my grandmothers who I love dearly and I respect them. And I'm, I'm going to be crushed when they leave this planet, but I know that's part of the game. It's part of the cycle, but who are my grandmothers? So I'm thinking of my dad's mother when she leaves this earth and I think about her to me, she is the feeling I get when I think of her from the experiences I've had with her, from the things she said to me, that's kind of distilled into an essence. So that thought was kind of profound to me that when we're gone, you know, we leave things behind. Maybe we've left behind art, artifacts. You've uh, left somebody your, your piano and your will or whatever it is. But really, your relationships is what what makes you, is what lives on. The relationship you have with other people or they have with you. A lot of it's one way, you know, in celebrity culture, so much of it's one way. You think about Michael Jackson and uh, billions of people know him, but he didn't know a lot of them. So they have this impression or a feeling that they get in their mind when they think about his music or when they think about his style or the way he moved or the way he spoke, or the controversy surrounding him, whatever it may be. It's those relationships. It's those strings in between us that kind of, that really print the impression that we have of the people. So I thought that was kind of, kind of neat. Just something to think about your essence. The relationship you've had with somebody is you to them. Also, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. Interconnectivity. Step back and see how do you fit into the bigger picture? What effect are you having on the other nodes, the other lives that you're connected to, your family, your relationships, your friends? Where do you fit into that? Are you, are you moving things forward? Are you helping things evolve? Do you slow things down? Are you assisting others on their path? Are you overcritical? of other people? Are you supportive? There's a time and a place for all these things, but they need to be thought about. We need to reflect on them. Once in a while, we need to step back and just see where we really fit into the big picture. And do we need to tweak our trajectory? Do we need to shift a couple degrees to the left or right to kind of find the middle way where we are being our our true selves? Yeah. Yeah. A couple, a little bit of food for thought. Some stuff I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks. Now, into the episode. This is Conjecture Time, episode 17 with Kay the Aquanaut. Kay is a local hip-hop artist. He's been rapping out of Saskatoon internationally for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. I didn't really ask him when he started, but I know he's been doing it forever. 
Kay graciously had me over to his apartment for this chat. We sat down in his kind of minimalist lifestyle apartment. It seems like he spends most of his time reading and writing, sleeping, thinking. There was no TV to be found in the place. And so we sat down and had a great chat. Um, at first, it's funny, uh, my adapter for my portable Zoom recorder would not power my device in his place when we plugged it in. I don't know what it is with the power in that building or something, or maybe I had a bad wire. But I ran to the store, grabbed some fresh batteries, and uh, we sat down and had this chat. I'm just going to pump Kay's tour dates. Uh, his tour kicks off tomorrow, Thursday, October 4th. This is with Lee Reed, Kay the Aquanaut, Praxis Life and Illogic. Thursday, October 4th in Winnipeg at the Windsor. Friday, October 5th in Regina, 33 and a third multinational. Saturday, October 6th in Saskatoon, Black Cat Tavern is the venue. Don't sleep, locals. Sunday, October 7th, Edmonton. Uh, October 10th in Kamloops. October 11th in Vancouver. Victoria, Tofino, and Salt Spring Island follow that. And they're calling this the Aftermathematical Tour. And this is part one. Stay tuned for more dates coming up. You can find Kay on Instagram at Aquanaut Music. And I believe on Twitter, he's Kay the Aquanaut. Or is it Aquanaut Music on Twitter too? I'm going to unprofessionally check it out while I'm doing this intro. This is a podcast. It can be loose. This isn't terrestrial radio. We're not paying $130,000 a minute for airtime. Uh, at K the Aquanaut on Twitter. And don't be shy to reach out. Conjecturetime at gmail.com or at Conjecturetime on Twitter. Say hi. Let me know you're listening. If you had any thoughts on the episode, great. If you got some ideas for future guests, I am, we are a global podcast here at Conjecture Time, but we are local in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. Um, I've done some Skype chats, but I'd prefer to sit down in person with meat bodies and get the, uh, get some body language, get some visual going on, catch a vibe. So let me know, reach out if there's somebody you think would make a good guest for Conjecture Time. Without further ado, I'm going to play you into this episode with a song from K the Aquanaut. I'm sh not sure which song I'm going to pick, but I'm going to insert it right after I say enjoy this chat with K the Aquanaut. With K the Aquanaut. With K the Aquanaut. With K the Aquanaut. Oh, no. 
while still moving forward I can look backwards while still moving forward I can look backwards while still moving forward So yeah, reason I reached out to you in the first place is, uh, well, I guess I I got back on Instagram. I, I don't think I was on it for like ten years, and I got on Instagram, I don't know, last year or something. Started following you, and then I saw what you were up to, and uh, I think it was right after you you released Hey Riot, and I checked something out off that, and I bought it, and I was just really vibing on it. I'd I'd heard your name around you know, the scene forever. I think I might've done sound for you a couple of times over the years. And I just kind of resonated with you in your, in the angst and then mm-hmm. there, some of the activism in your lyrics. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of, uh, you know, I found myself, especially when I joined Twitter a few years ago, started getting pretty fired up, you know, just, just following causes that you care about and seeing yeah, yeah. what's happening every day. And it became overwhelming. For sure. So I think I resonated with you a bit on that front. Um, yeah, I'll start with, start with that. What are you, uh, what fires you up? Mm, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I don't necessarily know, to be honest. I probably, I, th- I feel there's a lot of inspiration for me that I, I don't even uh, necessarily know where or why it's coming from, but it's something that drives the sort of the focus of my life and, um, you know, not to get too deep you know quote unquote deep right at the start but you know i think there's been you know multiple experiences that i've had just like not necessarily in this physical form but just uh, personality wise and uh energy wise that is somehow determining me to like focus my art specifically on like kind of social justice activism kind of you know teaching just kind of like being proud of like, you know, standing up for who you are and not kind of falling into sort of, you know, missing the whole point, I think, of communicating through art is just to like tell a story that connects people from generation to generation. And yeah, like I I always, you know, it would be nice to just be able to sort of focus and make music that's for for partying and shit like that. But I feel like my art has kind of just been just a reflection of me as a person and uh, for anyone who knows me, like, I'm super passionate about uh, a lot of things that, like, you know, can get me into trouble. And when I get into conversations with with folks who, who you know, in the past I may be, like, would butt heads with. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, I'm starting to realize that there's the distinction between, like, Kay the Aquanaut and myself is, like, there isn't one. It's just a, it's just, like, a branch of... Uh, of who I am type of thing so that's where you get to be your most extreme version or your most passionate version of yourself I think that's it like a lot of times people who meet me just in my day-to-day life you know and then get to know me as that and then see me perform think that there's like a real drastic difference but I feel like myself in my public life is just like a very very reserved uh, approach of just like who I actually am like I feel like I'm more authentic on stage than I am uh you know just sort of like being awkward socially in some interaction that I have with some person that type of thing so yeah to kind of like go full circle on what we were talking about there I think it's just like uh yeah just some kind of like uh drive that like i can't have a hard time explaining obviously as you can tell that's just like uh pushing me to make the type of art that i do uh and sort of just the focus that i have of trying to inspire people to you know make art that i 
I think just like liberates uh, everybody, not just only, you know, your uh, means to make a living or something like that. So, is there any specific causes that, uh, or like an event or anything that happened that, you know, got you fired up about a, a certain cause from an early age? Yeah, I think like anybody, you get shaped by your environment and um, kind of growing up where I I grew up and where I, I'm assuming you grew up as well is just sort of like uh dealing with a lot of like kind of fucking bullshit historically uh when you look at sort of even the beginning of the country that we you know uh, live in is the colonial history is disgusting as fuck and i think that for me has been a drive to like Mm -hmm. uh you know be an ally with the truth and like with uh actual you know humanity uh coming together you know, liberating, you know, people um, just not under the confines of some kind of like construct. And um, yeah, I feel that, uh, you know, there's just like a lot of interactions that I've had with people who have been in my immediate family or like uh, people that I grew up with or people that I went to school with and yada, yada, yada. And you just like, you know, run into so many kind of conversations and ignoramuses type shit that, you know, after a while, I think it's just, uh, you know, being taught certain lessons from, like, my grandparents who have raised me with a different kind of mind state than I think a lot of folks who grew up in, you know, this area sort of had. Um, I, you know, sort of was challenging a lot of ideas that people maybe were more comfortable with that, that I was around type of thing, just as far as like establishment, government, banking, you know, police. Uh, these are like a lot of things like aspects of my family growing up, like were taught to be cautious about and not like, you know, you know, keep your money underneath a cushion in your, your house as opposed to depositing your money in a bank, that type of thing. I kind of like grew up with a lot of like just um you know a perspective that I think not most people have uh coming from just like sort of you know eastern european roots that type of stuff so you, you raised by your grandparents yeah i mean i wasn't raised by them but uh, i was you know i think like most kids uh growing up in, in this area like uh you spend a lot of your time in the summer like going out for a month at a time or two months at a time staying with your grandparents and, uh, you know, when you're young and impressionable, uh, those conversations like hit super hard, especially when you're developing as a teenager or something. Yeah. Yeah. For and, sure. uh, yeah. So, and I mean, you know, those are obviously the same people who raised my parents. So that those, uh, those, uh, kind of ideals and, and those things also get continued on. And I think, you know, my parents were both very, uh, well, especially I feel like my mom was very uh, kind of rebellious with her parents because of a lot of like their worldviews and that type of thing. And, um, I, you know, my mom's like a badass. So she, you know, always taught me to like speak my mind and not be afraid to like trust my heart and call people out. And if you believe in something, stand up for it, you know, all types of like not like, oh, bow down, just do what other people tell you. That was not like something that... And, you know, me being like the youngest of older, a couple older brothers, you also get like a bit of a chip on your shoulder as well, I think, which probably, you know, ties into just, uh, you know, feeling like I need to like take a stand type of thing. And I think that's like, uh, you know, I'm learning as I'm getting older that, you know, the the mission of my art is like, uh, yeah, just to like fucking if I can provide anybody like some confidence, like you were saying, like just uh, someone can resonate with an idea that I put out there about like, Hey, like, yeah, you know what? That makes sense. Like, uh, you know, relating sort of like what are supposedly radical ideas is just like being actually like normal. Yeah. Just, just looking at the label can be, can be radical to some people. Why are you reading all the ingredients? Don't worry. It's all approved. Don't worry about it. You know? Yeah. That's always the response. It's just kind of like, you know, especially, um, in this area, you know, areas like a lot of times, you know, people hear the music that I make and are just like, you know, turned off by it, like, oh, the audacity of uh, someone speaking against like, you know, you grow up in Canada and, you know, yada, yada. But like, 
like like you said it's all a fucking facade and that's the i think just when you speak honesty to people it comes off as like offensive and abrasive and you know most people want a gentle massage they don't want to like yeah a, there's that line there's there's there seems to be i don't know if there's more of that or i just notice it more in society where where people want to be less and less offensive maybe it's just you know as as social justice you know is a uh, like the just the term itself is kind of tainted. It carries so much weight and dogma yeah. to it. Yeah, but, that's it. I, I feel that I completely agree. I think it's, uh, you know, not to like be the typical, uh, you know, social media shade type thing, but I, I feel like it's just kind of like a, a PC culture that's been kind of like algorithmed into reality right now where it's like creating drama online. So, you know, people... You know, it's like alienating people through fucking text messages is basically what it's coming down to. And it's almost like, yeah, everyone's so scared to offend everybody now that it's actually offensive to everybody that like, you know, there isn't like a people are so worried about offending everyone that they can't even like be themselves anymore. And that's kind of like and I'm not like, you know, that's not some way to like condone people being ignorant about what they're saying online but right. i think it's like you know attacking people that you have no idea who they are or what their situation is because of like a 80 letter sentence online is kind of like to me just a fucking waste of time and i think that's the you know ultimately the reality is people should be spending less time online worrying about what other people are writing on their yeah. facebook page and then focusing on their own fucking life and like making themselves better with the time that they're wasting trying to make other people better. Like speak I, your mind to somebody's face where they can respond and they get yeah. the body language and you get the whole picture. Yeah, or log off, <laughs> look in the mirror yeah. and like say those things that you're saying to that person to yourself because probably reality, it's like most things yeah. that probably piss you off in the world are like self-reflection things that like annoy you about yourself as well type of thing, you know? Yeah, so it's like, it. it's easier to point the finger, you know, at somebody else and I think yeah, that's exactly. social media is really open that door up to be like, hey, I'm fucking an activist online because I post one article, but the same person could walk down the street and see the police like harassing some fucking young kid and like wouldn't even dare to fucking say right. anything. You know what I mean? Well, he or, must have done something. Bad. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, avoid confrontation and then I'm going to get home and write a fucking blog about it. You know, to me, that's, that's whack. Like, I don't think that's activism. I think that's fucking, you know, might create awareness, but it also is like, you know get outside like yeah go help out people that are in your actual community like don't think that posting a, about greenpeace online is making you change the fucking world go to like a fish farm yeah. somewhere and do something dope there like affect your neighborhood yeah so go you're the only one exactly that can. yeah you know what i mean like that's it i think that's uh the sad thing about it is it's like the kind of the facade that like social media is bringing everyone together but in reality it's just really alienating everybody and sort of like creating a lot more division and it's like al almost like creating a way to like be more disconnected because you can see who's messaging you you don't have to respond to them you don't have to let them know that right. you know to me that's kind of like extra step of saturate uh, yeah separation. it is it's yeah. like you know and you know people wonder why ever you know so many people are fucking depressed we and, all everyone has know. social anxiety now and that's it man yeah. everyone's like yeah yeah whatever i mean it sound yeah. hella old saying this right now like, yeah, like exactly. yeah, fuck social media but i feel like uh you know there's it's like a tool like anything else you can fucking you know precisely nail in uh nails with a hammer or you can fucking smack your head with the hammer and uh exactly. like depending on how you use the tool is like the effectiveness of it and i feel like uh yeah fuck pc culture i ain't down with it man like obviously keeping people in check is important no, but like free speech above all but yeah fight your battles that like you know you can actually win and not like you know just trying to talk shit to people because you you're having a bad day i think that's why yeah yeah and on an on a environmental front, I remember remember when I was a kid, like the first time I really thought of, I, before I ever knew what activism was, but the first time I felt like, like I gotta, I gotta say something about this, was when I learned that the shit that came out of an exhaust pipe of a car was poisonous. Right. I was like, what? Right. All these cars are shooting poison out? Mm -hmm. This is the same air that we're breathing? Mm -hmm. And nobody seemed to bat an eye on it. It was just, yeah, well, there's lots of air, you know, it goes in the air and it's... It's, it's the same thing, you know, it's still, that should, you know, just on that topic specifically, like the other day I was think, thinking about that actually, there's a business, I'm not going to name their names, but they have like a patio on a fucking pretty busy street 
and you know it's like kind of an uppity spot so you see people in like suits and nice dresses out there eating and you know there's like 800 cars ripping by them you know and the oh, exhaust yeah. in the air but like those same people if like you know some dude was walking by smoking a cigarette would be you know pinching their nose and kind of like you know i i'm a big you know as i we were talking before i don't drive i like i'm very anti-car culture i don't like you know people's reliance on cars i think it's pathetic and whack and like um, obviously if you know i'm talking within a city and mm -hmm. uh it's just sort of how that gets co-signed as being like no one cares that like they're breathing in you know car particulates but it's like if you smoke a cigarette in front of a business like you're going to jail basically you know what i mean so it's right. kind of like just another one of those weird fucking you know battles that like um yeah, I don't even know why we started talking about this. Oh, yeah, activism-wise. Yeah, like, that's it. Just kind of picking these fucking weird things in your life to, like, combat, you know, where it's, like... Things that we become complacent about. Yeah. Like, that, some, somebody needs to scratch that surface and say, hey, look at this. Like, we've yeah, fucking been ignoring this. Yeah, and I feel, uh, for me uh, in particular, with just, like, the music that I make is, like, yeah, I kind of want to, like, be that person that, like... Um, I want to affect you through my art. And if it makes you either completely love what I'm saying, then that's great. And if it makes you completely hate what I'm saying and like makes you angry or you don't agree with what I'm saying or think I'm, you know, talking out of line, then I'm probably doing that for a reason to like challenge, uh, you know, people's thoughts. Like I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I've used this like term before, but it's as far as like massaging people with my music. It's like, I want people to enjoy my music, but I also want people to like just feel a certain type of way from it. I don't necessarily want it to just be like a you want a reaction. You don't want it to be breeze. elevator music. Yeah, I want a reaction exactly, and if that's uh, positive or negative, um, you know, I, I think it's just all kind of the purpose of what how you feel about it. So yeah, I know. love that. I'm a big comedy fan, and I love you know comedians say that all the time, like. It's, it's way better to for half the room to love you mm. and half to hate you mm -hmm. than than to have whatever everybody think you're all right. Hell yeah, so yeah, you know, yeah, like polarized motherfucker. A funny story, actually, like sort of on that polarization shit is a, uh, you know, for peeps who like you know aren't familiar with kind of the locality where we're at. There's like a festival every summer, uh, where you know, quote unquote, jazz fest that brings you know acts in type of thing from all over the world to play and a few years ago i was playing it and uh played a show at a local spot and yeah rock the rock the fest basically with a, a couple homies and sort of later got some feedback uh from some woman who like you know i had heard she had made a mention that like she thought I was disrespectful to be a part of that festival and that, you know, the, the things that I was talking about on, you know, her night enjoying the festival was really uncalled for and, you know, uh, how it sort of ruined her evening and et cetera, et cetera. And like, you know, I, at first I was kind of like taken aback by it and like somewhat offended just to be like, oh, that, you know, that sucks that that happened. But then in reality, like the more I started thinking about it, is like that was like the one thing she remembered from that whole night was like me saying something that just completely made her night just ruined and like for anyone who knows my lyrics like it's like if you get offended about the shit that I'm talking about then like I you know am not too concerned about you because it's like you know if you love uh, corporate culture and you love you know kind of resource extraction all that type of shit then yeah you're probably gonna hate my music but newsflash like yeah that's the whole fucking point so i'm kind of like you know with my art that's it it's like yeah sorry that the 50 year old uh kind of caucasian lady i i ruined her night at jazz fest but yeah that was kind of the whole fucking point probably of me playing the song that like made her feel that type of way like and for me, that was a success. Like it hurt at the, in the moment, but then you have that reflection of being like, wait a minute, like that's the whole p purpose of the art that I'm making is like to get a reaction. And that was the reaction that, you know, and she felt a certain type of way enough to like speak out about it, you know, year a year afterwards to me about it. So uh, start know, a conversation. Yeah, that's it. I'm kind of just like, well, you're still thinking about it. So you know, yeah. hopefully you thought about why you got so offended. By she probably that. told somebody about it. Maybe her yeah, kids. No, I think she told many people about it. Yeah. Cause I had heard from, you know, another, a couple other peeps that like 
this conversation had happened before. So anyways, long story yeah. short. And, you know, um, yeah, I feel I've been on a bit of a mission in the last few albums to really like, you know, kind of spark conversation and just sort of inspire kind of people that, um, you know, might feel that they're, you know, relate ha- having trouble relating with sort of, co- you know, corporate mainstream sort of ideals and, you know, especially music wise and hip hop wise, if you don't have the time to like be searching the crates and, you know, you uh, hear someone that you connect with that's not being played on the mainstream radio like myself, then, you know, that's that's a, always a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> I feel. Uh, yeah. You're on the street. You, you put out three albums last year. Uh, no, I or, put out two, two in 2017, one in 2016. Yeah, I put out uh, an album called Station Wagon in 2016. I put I put one out on uh, Spotify. They all say 2017. Yeah, Maybe that's, that's just when it went up. That's just exactly my uh, fucking you know online skills uh, being pushed into action there oh, when yeah. my Spotify account was created, I guess. But uh, uh, yeah, so Station Wagon came out in 2016, and then last year I put out two albums. Um, I put out an album called Seven Vessels last year with Factor Chandelier. He produced all the beats, and uh, yeah, that album did super good. It was like on, uh, you know, it spent like nine or ten weeks on college radio, and it was like number one for four four weeks, number two for, you know, a couple weeks as well, and uh yeah, I got recommended to the jury's list for the Polaris Prize as well. And, you know, as far as just like, uh, you know, industry slash success wise, like it, it got received pretty well. It got, you know, made a lot of, uh, made it to a lot of ears that I think like a lot of my music hasn't made it to before. And that was, you know, sort of the point with that album. It's kind of like a, you know, more of an upbeat kind of just like, you know, still conscious, conscious lyrics, but, mm. uh, sort of like a dancier vibe, more of a part, right. party a little vibe. more accessible. There's yeah. some more, some more hooks that people can. Yeah. It's it more, yeah, exactly. More, it's a more of an easy listen, like repetitive wise. I guess it just makes more sense to like, uh, kind of like, uh, party hip hop kind of vibe, that type of thing. And yeah, that's still my baby. I still uh, love Seven Vessels, everything about it. And that whole experience was just amazing, putting that out. Uh, I put it out on a label uh, called Fake Four Inc. And, um, you know, for me growing in the last few years as an artist was like always a dream to like get something, even just like a single or something on Fake Four. And then eventually to have like a project come out with it, like pretty prestigious as far as I'm concerned, like underground hip hop. A label you know that was a big success for for me personally and then uh yeah kind of put that out and in the same time when i was recording seven vessels i uh, went on a tour of sort of uh france a tour in france i did like six dates in france um and while i was out there i got kind of got the whim when i was going out there i was like reading a bunch of hemingway and shit and i was sort of getting uh, just a crazy inspiration to just be writing as much as I could while I was on the road. And I contacted my homie Mackie, who was also the guy who made the beats for uh, Station Wagon. Um, and he ended up sending me some beats while I was on tour and in uh, France and wrote a project while I was out there. Um, you know, just like at coffee shops and drinking beer by myself and just like walking around writing, basically... Um, came back recorded that as well and then by the time seven vessels was finished i also had the yeah riot done as well and you know the things that i i've been doing is i've been trying to build with this uh tape label based out of claremont ferrand france called uh hello la and it's like a super diy tape label uh, old school cassette and digital and like for me that's like a big thing i grew up listening to tapes and i love tape culture i think it's like super dope uh to me it's like vinyl you know like i i hold cassettes on that same esteem um and yeah so then i, I kind of just was like fuck it i want to put out two albums in the same year like a lot of the artists that i respected like in the mainstream were like dropping you know albums every year two years type thing and so i was like fuck it i have it done i'm gonna do it kind of just self-released it um put out 50 limited edition copied cassettes and uh just digital 
and yeah just kind of put it out for free as well on my band camp to download if peeps wanted to check it out and yeah that that was uh basically the lead up until this year so yeah i dropped yeah riot on the, my birthday last year which was november 30th and yeah, i'm kind of like gonna just get on the road to tour it coming up uh in october of this year so yeah almost like a year later i'm just finally hitting the road to tour yeah right oh, congratulations on that yeah that's, yeah that's huge it's, it's exciting just following you just watching those boom you know come out yeah thanks, that far man. apart because this the waves seem to still be rising from the first one and then boom yeah another one comes out that's it i wanted to like you know i will i am a work hard type dude and like for me it's just like almost out of necessity why i write as much as i do and um i'm just uh trusting the process of like anytime i get into the studio anytime that i write and um just sort of like I'm not going to let, like, the constraints of just, like, you know, me thinking that I have to wait to, like, you know, I'm not, like, and that's probably my biggest detriment as an artist is, like, I don't think about art in the terms of, like, marketing. So I'm not, like, I don't really give a fuck that, like, oh, you put out an album three months after you put out this other album. Like, I don't give a shit. To me, I'm, like, in time, if that music's out there, people are going to hear it or they're not. And, like, me worrying about, like, uh, my marketing is not going to help my creative like process. And for me, like, yeah, I've, I literally have like, or collaborated on like 20 plus albums in my life. And that is not anything that I'm ever going to look back on and be like, damn, like I shouldn't have put out so many projects. Yeah. You know what marketing I mean? Marketing strategy. Yeah. Is off. That's it, man. I, like, you know, he talked to lots of motherfuckers that just like, Oh, uh, waiting for the perfect time to drop this single that I'm going to drop. And you know, two years later, the single hasn't dropped. And it's like, man, like, yeah, you know, you have to sort of come to terms, I think, with the reality of like, you know, if you're in marketing to no one, then what's the fucking point? You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, it's, exactly. it's kind of like something over nothing. Yeah, I'm kind of that way, man. Like, you know, I always like a good friend of mine back in the day sort of taught me the idea of just like having a thousand fans as an artist and like being mm -hmm. able to survive. And like, I feel like I'm at that level. My sales are always sort of at that same range. I have my super hardcore uh, fans that like really fuck with my shit and, you know, support me in really positive ways. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of like, you know, peeps kind of overseas that support my shit too, which, uh, you know, I think a lot of peeps maybe in the vicinity around here, like don't necessarily understand or know about and not that that matters or anything, but it's just like... Uh, for me, you know, just keeping the people that want more music from me happy and putting out more music, especially if it's not like a problem or I feel like I'm forcing it or that right. type of thing. Like I'm like approaching my art in this day and age is like a like a novel type approach where it's like I'm kind of like using every album to sort of express a certain idea or concept. It's not like you know a lot of people i think put the emphasis on being like this album is like the epitome of me like myself mm. as an artist and i never think about art like that i'm like no like like literally i was reading um for whom the uh bells toll by uh hemingway i read it twice in a row back to front to back like within a week or something i read it you know and it's not a tough read but it's not an easy read either but that book inspired yeah riot the whole way through and it's like not to say that um yeah riot wasn't inspired by the things that were happening in my life but like you know that's kind of the focus of my art is like whatever inspires me in the moment then like if that's what the mm. next focus is going to be and you know in the last few years like since uh, since yeah riot came out i've been uh my literature approach has been uh, I've, I'm reading a lot di of different material than I was at that time. And so the new projects that I have coming out right away, like, you know, by right away, I mean like in the next kind of 12 months type of thing, I'm going to have two more albums that are coming out and they're both pretty much finished, but they're totally different focus than like the previous couple albums that I have. So I think it's like, um, just a, w a way for me to just keep my art fresh. You know what I mean? I'm just like... Mm, I love that though. That's, that's inspiring for me too, because, uh, I think I, I can definitely fall on the other side of the coin where I'm too precious about some shit. Mm -hmm. I've got so much shit I'm sitting on mm -hmm. where 
you know, it just gets stale if you don't put it out. And whatever, let that be. A, it doesn't have to be your autobiography in this one song or this one album. Yeah. It's just, this is a time and place. I'm moving on. Like, yeah. I, I love that, man. I think that's like, you know, especially too, if it's like you're a person, like, you know, if anybody's like myself that, you know, I feel like I'm over flooded by inspiration. And like, this isn't to like, you know, like sometimes it's not a good thing to have that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, um, but I feel like I have a lot of shit to say and I'm conscious that like my time within like this body that I have right now is going to be over sometime soon. And I want to get out as much as I can to like whoever wants to listen to it. And like, if nobody wants to listen to it, I've already come to terms with that like many, many years ago. So it's like, for me, the focus of the art is like for me as a person to like express myself and get things out there because a lot of the times I'll listen to my own art. Like I'll listen to an album I put out five years ago and like hear a song that I'm like, holy shit. Like I'm like basically predicting my whole future kind of thing. And like, that's a song that I probably spent 20 minutes writing or something. You know what I mean? In the time, like, smoking a joint and drinking beer and not thinking anything about it you know but it's just kind of like you know i think create creativity and consciousness is a super powerful thing and the only thing that gets in the way of a lot of times people like letting that be shared with the world is like your own self-criticisms that you impose like you know like if, if you're listening to like a mix of a song that you recorded two years ago and then you you know if you listen to that song 300 times well of course you're going to hear things that you don't like about it and the more you think that you don't like it then the less likely it's going to come out like you know. reinforce that and yeah, yeah you'll you know, find something if you're looking for it that's it like that's it's completely it and you know if you let sort of that self-doubt um you know there's a lot of people in the world that like want that that to be a thing like a lot of people without even knowing it try to like talk shit about other people's creativities or inspirations or aspirations be without them even knowing because there's like a jealousy or like a fear that someone might be doing something cool that they're not doing and like that shit rubs off on you you know and like as an artist it's important to be like you know obviously in the world and like being a functioning human being and not you know living under a bridge by choice type of thing like yeah have your fucking life together but don't surround yourself with people if you're an artist that are gonna like just distract you or like deter you from like making art or putting art out like you know i think uh you know, careful with your inspiration because it's like, it's a powerful thing. And if you start quelling that, then those like, that becomes like a habit, you know, and mm-hmm. habits are hard to break. So. Yeah. It's, it's hard to wear. It, it sucks to wear both hats at the same time where you're creating the art and you're like criticizing yourself. You mm-hmm. gotta, you gotta put the criticism down and let it, yeah. let it come out. I imagine like, I was going to ask you how you, how you write, but it like, it sounds like it's a lot of stream of consciousness, like this stuff. You don't, you don't overthink it. You like to, yeah i mean let it come i'm not like a spring chicken anymore you know i'm uh, getting up there as far as like rap age goes and uh i've been doing music for a lot a lot of years and doing a lot of writing for a lot of years and i think it's just like you know there has obviously been times growing up and like maturing as an artist where you um overthink things or like you know as far as writing rap lyrics or something you're you know oh i need to have the this double rhyme pattern in the middle of this line with this other double rhyme pattern and then i'm gonna bring it back to the you know like there's people kill themselves thinking about that type of shit like Mm -hmm. and that's not to knock anyone's hustle if that's what you know what you're going for in your rhymes is is like the intricacy of the patterns that's cool but for me it's always just been about the met the message and like um the patterns are obviously important too. I do focus on patterns and writing patterns, but I don't ever like, I would never let a song be determined by the pattern. Like for me, it's like, you know, more often than not, I'll hear a beat and I get like some sort of visual representation. I forget, you know, do you know what the term's called when you can like see music? I forget what it's called. It's like, you know, it's like a certain type of, uh, but you can sort of like see the, the vibrations kind of we'll thing, see, but like colors. And yeah. Stuff like like that. in that sort of vein, exactly. It's like, you know, I think Jimmy Hendrix said Maybe he like audio visualization play by colors or something. Yeah. I forget. There's I some know. kind of like, you know, term, but I, I can't remember what it is. But anyways, yeah. when I hear so, uh, something like a beat or even just like a skeleton of a beat or something like that, like I always get like some visualization 
that happens and that always is going to be usually what determines like the focus of the song um yeah more often than not when i start writing have some sort of idea of what the direction of the song is going to be and uh and i think too a lot of the times like you know my songs will have a different meaning for me than like sometimes people will bring up to me about certain things like sometimes if someone will ask me like what well, what does this what did that song actually mean you know what i mean and like um not in a confused way, but just sort of asking me what that, my point of the song was. And if I explain it to them, the like sort of the inspiration of that song, then it in times in the past has been like, oh, I didn't think it meant that at all. I thought it meant kind of this type of thing, which is great for art. But it's like, uh, yeah, for me, like the process being that I sort of have an idea, a concept or an idea that I want to sort of focus on or, and like bring to light in the, in the song. And then, yeah, I usually just write, man, like, uh, based on the beat, do you have music first or yeah, well, it depends. Like Not necessarily. there's a lot of processes, uh, different processes that I get. Um, so like when I'm working with factor, what we've been doing for the last couple of years, um, is basically like we get together and sort of just make a song from start to finish. And like, so he'll start making the beat while I'm sitting in the studio. I start like oh, that's getting ideas. We start building the songs back and forth. He hears what I have, sort of the ideas that I have, maybe the pattern that I'm sort of uh, taking a melody or something. And, um, and then, yeah, we sort of form the song and record it in the same process. And since we've been doing that process the last couple of years, um, I've been do going back to sort of more old school style writing where I'm just uh, writing without music, just writing kind of poetry basically and, you know, four lines of something that I just get inspired by one day or like, you know, just writing two words or just kind of things down that I'm just like, oh shit, that's dope throughout the week. And then when I get into the studio, I have like, you know, five, six pages of just ideas and, um, you know, sort of just like picking pieces from different ideas and being like, oh, this sounds perfect, you know? Yeah. And like, I found a lot of the time it was trippy in the sense where like, you know, I'd be having an idea or sort of a reoccurring theme in the stuff I was writing. Then I'd go to the studio and like, I swear, like Factor would just make a beat that I'd be like, man, this is like, you know, just sort of like the resonance of those ideas and just kind of like, you know, for me, um, I've been thinking about the world on a lot of like, you know, uh, crazy levels I feel in the last few months and years and just sort of like the interconnectedness and you know we were talking about this before we started recording tonight mm -hmm. just sort of like you know the resonance of just like ideas and creativity and just like uh, energy you know connectivity and just sort of these things that like drive not only human life but just like my art and everybody's art mm -hmm. like and yeah I'm like just trying to like doubt myself less and just sort of trust that like I know I'm a writer. I know I'm dope. I and like not to ever like convince myself otherwise. You know what I mean? And just trusting that like if I go in the studio and write a song and record it, that it's going to be good. And don't ever think that it's not going to be good kind of thing, you know. And that's not to say that like, you know, obviously you record songs that you're like, "Ah, that didn't work out." Yeah. But like, you imagine know. if you thought that if you're a basketball player, every time you take a jump shot, yeah. it might not go in. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, you know, it is like whatever cliche to like compare things to sports, but for me, I grew up like around sports and I think about that as well. Like, yeah, you know, and you and I, I think like hard work too, like work ethic. That's another thing that like people be like, "Oh, you know, like, how did you put out, you know, this, that many albums in that much time or whatever? And I'm like, because I like literally have dedicated my whole life. You're not to, watching Game of yeah, Thrones every night. Yeah. You, like for real, you, you're in my apartment right now. I don't like, you know, yeah, rock a no, TV. No I don't TV. fucking, you know, I, I'm, I live and breathe hip hop music and writing. And it's like, you know, it's not to be like, oh, you know, I work so hard, yada, yada. But it's just like, no, I've literally dedicated my entire life to like making rap music and um, I love it. And so it's not um, like, har it's not hard work for me. It's just like doing what I love and like really just focusing in on a passion. And uh, I feel like, yeah, people just should, you know, not be afraid to just like trust your, your desires and your passions in life and, you know, don't let, someone else tell you what you feel kind of thing if mm -hmm. you you know if you think you got something to say or you got you got art to make make it and people that are trying to deter you from doing that like cut those people out of your life like literally it's not 
what's more important you know what i mean like that's the thing someone telling you to do something or you doing what you want to do like that kind of thing yeah yeah it's one thing for somebody who doesn't have an introspective eye and doesn't look at themselves to have other people like trying to keep them in check but if you're like I spend a lot of time myself. I can I can handle it. You yeah, know? yeah, and I think you know, and that all comes within reason too. It's like, um, you know, it's important to like be healthy and um, make art in a good, healthy way too. I mean, it's like, you know, inflicting like self punishment on yourself to like be an artist is whack, and like don't let anyone tell you that. Like, otherwise, you know, it's there's so, no longevity in that. Yeah, that's it. It's like you know. I think people sometimes are like embarrassed or like scared to say that they like maybe work a job or something and like do art or do music otherwise. And it's like, you know, you know, there's nothing more whack than like, you know, not being able to take care of your fucking self you yeah. know, as an adult. And so like, yeah, art is a, the be all end all, but like being healthy and happy and, um, you know, having a roof over your head and food to eat and like not, you know, being a scumbag human being and stealing money and, you know, that type of thing is like, like, yeah, everything within reason and like having people around you that are going to keep you in check about making irrational decisions related to art is a different story than someone like deterring you from like making art, I guess, like, you know, right. in the sense of, you know, it's good to have people around you that keep you in check, but not want to like talk shit or throw Pull shade you down. on you. Yeah, because, that that you know, seems to be a thing when people see somebody getting you know too far ahead of them not not better but mm -hmm. just excelling at something you know they'll get a little bit jealous so they'll be like oh, for sure and i think that like happens you know within um relationships like you know with partners um it happens within people's families within people's mm -hmm. groups of friends people that you maybe work with um yeah you never know when it's going to come from and it's just like yeah jealousy or um you know yeah, some people don't always want to see you succeed, whether they even realize it or not. And so, yeah, it's important to, you know, be careful with, like, you know, you, the people that you let influence you. And it's good to have people that will call you out. But, like, yeah, if you got, like, you know, whatever, someone who's in your circle that's, like, you know, making you feel bad or you talking shit about your art constantly yeah. or critiquing you or, you know, that type of stuff, like, it's important to... To be able to be like, all right, I need no more of you. Yeah, like life's too short. Mm -hmm. You can cut those people out. Yeah. So when you're, that's cool that you you said you're in the studio sometimes, fact will be making a beat and you're writing to it on the spot. Yeah. So in those kind of cases, are you guys co, like, do you guys both own the album or do you you buy the beats from him or how do you, uh, well, I guess you're making it yeah. together. So do you, yeah, I mean, not to really like, you know, put our business out there as far as like, no, I'm just curious finances wise. Like, yeah. Like for me and factor, it's like, you know, that's like my literally like family type thing. He's, a you know, a guy that I've been making music with and hanging out with for so many years that like me and him have a, a different relationship than other people. We've lived in the same city together. Like, you know, I'm like good friends with his wife and, you know, I'm at their house all the time, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, our relationship is more just based on the art. And both your names are on the album. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's, and it's like, that's, a an, that's an important thing. creation. That's yeah. an important thing for me as an artist is like, and a rapper specifically, like with having a producer is, you know, even on the Station Wagon album and the Yeah Riot album, like I always want to give credit to the people making the beats and, um, like that's just as important to me and so yeah, for factor and i it's like everything that we do is uh split down the middle 50 50 um and yeah like you know we don't compensate each other for our labor back and forth but like uh we just you know have a mutual understanding that like uh you know putting if we're going to be making art together we're going to be putting it out together and we're going to be touring it together and we're going to be yeah. promoting it together and that's dope it's like it's like starting a company and having an employee or or going both in yeah. on the company. So there's stakes for both of you, you know, yeah. it's win-win it's and there's, yeah. you don't have to think about... You know, I think it's like at a point now where, you know, we've talked many times, Factor and I, in the past about like starting a group uh, name because it's like that's kind of what we, me and him are, you know. Like I feel like honestly the music that I make with Factor is sort of different than the music that I make with other people. So it's kind of not... Uh, you know, it's not a stretch to like think of Factor and I as kind of like a, a unit, you know, like a group, so to speak. And so, 
yeah, like we just have a mutual understanding, a working relationship. We inspire each other. We support each other. We, uh, you know, just, just ride for each other. It's good. Mm-hmm. Like just an old school homie of mine that like, um, you know, I would do anything for him, like that type of thing. And, you know, if uh, he ever needs me to sing a weird, obscure harmony on a song with a vocal effect, like I'll drop whatever I'm doing and go do that type of thing. So That's it's awesome like... awesome to have that chemistry. Yeah, he's like my boy, man. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like... And like you were talking about with the instincts and like interconnectivity, there's something about just spending a lot of time around somebody, having a lot of experiences with them going to, you know, your vulnerable space, your creative space where you just yeah. get each other in that wavelength, there's like a channel open where you can... Yeah, I think that's another big thing for him and I is like, you know, the amount of work that we've both done and together and separately is like, there's just like a mutual respect and understanding of like the hustle, the kind of the grind that goes into it. But yeah, like you said, just spending so much time together, you know, in a vulnerable kind of mindset you know which when you're making art like it is a vulnerable uh, state to be in um that we've just done so much shit together that we just like trust each other so much that like if he tells me that uh, like that take i recorded is bad like i just trust it i would never doubt like uh, i don't know i kind of liked it type of thing like i know he's telling me out of the purest space that like i should re-record that part same with me on him if i'm like oh you know on this part of the sequence what if we drop this out and, you know, bring this more into the focus of the beat? You know, he's always going to, like, at the very least, try it and, like, you know, and just sort of having a complete trust in each other that, uh, you know, there's no ulterior motives with him and I. It's like we're just, like, both kind of rooting for each other. and Yeah, it's nice know, when you're both it's, in it's it together a pure, like that. Yeah, it's a pure, uh, you know, kind of working relationship where, you know, even if... Uh, you know, one of us stopped doing art, which is never going to happen that like we would still be friends and still kick it. And it's not like, uh, you know, a weird dynamic that I think sometimes happens where there's like a reliance on one or the other. It's just kind of like, we just love working together. We make crazy art together. And and I think ultimately we just both inspire each other, which is important. Like in Saskatoon, and you know, it's like a small hip hop community here and it's pretty fragmented community in this day and age too. So it's like, to have like a homie that I can meet up with 52 times in a year and fucking make an album together with, like, I'm never going to say no to that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So it's dope. Hey, who did the, uh, the artwork for that album for seven vessels? I mm. love the, the cover art for that. Mm-hmm. It's super dope. Yeah. So there's a, a dude, uh, he lives in, I think he, I think he's, I think he's in Austin, Texas now. Um, his name is, uh, he goes by the name Noise319. Is this rap moniker. He, uh, is like a super kind of legend with like online hip hop, under, underground hip hop uh, forums, uh, like internet forums back in the day. He, yeah, he started a website called, uh, Uggs Mag, Underground Sound, uh, magazine. And basically is like a sort of a go-to, and it's still uh, live today, a go-to website for like rap nerds like myself to like go check out the new shit that was dropping basically like every week. And so uh, back in the day, it was like a website that kind of brought people together to like talk shit on message boards about hip hop. And then it ended up becoming sort of like an online promotion tool and sort of just repping for artists. With that, at the same time, uh, Noise319 was always, like, doing digital art as well. And so, yeah, he's been a guy that's, like, been uh, doing kind of digital art and, like, website programming, stuff like that, for, like, a lot of pretty, you know, heavyweight companies and people and artists and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, yeah, he's been a friend of ours. He lived in Saskatoon for many years, and I knew him when he was living in Edmonton as well. When we would go play shows out there, we would stay at his crib. And, uh, yeah, just became, like, rap homies, um, and, like, uh, yeah, just, like, a guy that I know is fucking an amazing artist and always kills it, and so, and he's super, like, uh, on point with the tech game, so he helps a lot with, like, the formatting of the albums and the layouts and kind of just making sure that everything looks tight and as far as, uh, you know, all the stuff that I can't do as far as, like, making banners for your facebook page or whatever the fuck it is and 
Yeah, so anyways, he has sort of been involved with Factor and I's um, art for a long time. And it just was like a no-brainer for us to ask him to do that. And, you know, the insane thing about that art, it's so dope. Like, I was blown away when I saw it. But the real crazy thing about that is that literally, like, before we sent the art to or the music to, to him, I had sent Factor... Uh, an image being like, ah, this is kind of like the idea that I have for the album cover. And, um, should I send this to Dave? Like his name's Dave. Should I, uh, noise 319. Should I send it to him or should I just let him kind of freak it on what he thinks the album's going to sound like? And factor is like, nah, nah, just let him hear it. And then he can decide. And sure enough, like the image that I sent him was like a sketch outline of like a person laying in corpse pose, like <laughs> literally. And so then he, he bump, you know, sends this art back, whatever, a few weeks later, and it's a skeleton laying in corpse pose, like, you know, sort of embodied in like the, in the consciousness, the ocean of consciousness basically there. And, um, I was just like, man, that, like that is crazy that he had the exact same kind of idea from that, you know? And I, I just, you know, once I saw it, like, I was just like, yeah, obviously this yeah, is that fucking imagery art, is badass, Yeah, man. so, you know, we went through a few different, like, font layouts on it and stuff like that, and we finally ended up going with the one that we have uh, now, but, yeah, that that art is like a fucking, you know, that'll be in the Louvre someday or something, you know, like, I feel like so that shit's good. pretty epic, man, just yeah. Just the texture in yeah, it, like, yeah. it's like the skeleton is laying in, like, a polymer yeah, ocean like or something. Yeah, like, that's the thing with him, he's cool, he's a... Uh, you know, he's an interesting dude. He's so, he's such an inspiration. He'll like, you know, he made that himself. So that was like a figure that he built and like kind of squished it into some sort of like material there. So it's like, um, <clears throat> and yeah, like, I don't know if you were following any of like the online campaign, media campaign leading up to that. Um, but there was like, he made a bunch of like sort of small videos of like that stick figure, like in a rowboat, like paddling and you know maybe right around when i was getting on instagram yeah so yeah there you go those, so yeah. yeah so i mean yeah he killed it and it was just basically uh you know sort of his his design and his uh, concept but it was also like the same sort of idea that i had in mind so it just worked out so perfectly and uh yeah he also uh did the artwork for the yeah riot album as well so he's like my go-to guy as far as like layout and design and that type of thing and he's like uh yeah, yeah the super homie man like he's uh you know a god in the rap game like if you go anywhere in north america and you go to like an independent hip-hop show of like dudes who are in sort of my range of uh age type uh you know era type of thing like you know i would almost guarantee probably like seven out of ten of these peeps at these shows will know who he is like say his name again uh noise 319 okay yeah so he's next level man check him out and ugsmag.com that's the website that he's sort mm. of uh running and uh yeah if you want to geek out on independent hip-hop uh yeah ugsmag.com noise 319 game. man tell me about mackie a little bit who's yeah. who's mac i'd never really heard of him before and yeah I kinda, uh, there's not much about him yeah mackie's like uh like on the internet when I, I just looked around at a bit of searching for him and I think he had like a, you know, maybe a private Twitter account or something. I yeah, was like, he's like, this guy? He's low pro as far as like his so social media. Oh, my dog's coughing you. Um, he's low pro as far as like social media goes. But uh, yeah, Mackie's like a Canadian, like I'd say legend. I'm going to say it. He might hate me for it, but he's a legendary producer. He uh, has worked with, you know, yeah yeah go for it he's worked with uh you know a lot of like dope projects over the years and artists in the past that i've like albums that i've listened to growing up and um yeah it was kind of like you know loosely just connected through hip-hop oh my man thank you and um you know we had talked about working together uh for a long time and by like a long time i mean like twice or three times we talked about working together type of thing but uh ended up getting to a point where a homie like uh well so so is his name he's like a saskatoon kind of legendary rap dude uh had mentioned that you know mackie wanted to uh work with me and like i had told troy that which uh, so so that i wanted to work with him and uh yeah one thing led to another and yeah i think like uh, you know, Mackie and I, an important thing for us is that like we kind of like we align uh, politically, ethically, our focus with our. 
Hey. Our focus with uh, art is like super kind of in line. And uh, yeah, Mackie's a hella badass dude. And so for uh, us, it started with him just kind of sending me a beat through the internet um, on like a, you know, just like a vibe. We, I wrote a song, I think like within a few minutes kind of thing and was just super hyped on it. And then it was like a few messages back and forth being like, let's just do a project together. And he was down. And the next thing you know, like a week later, I had a full file of beats, uh, you know, 15 beats or something to work on. And, you know, for anyone who knows me, like, uh, it's like, you know, the happiest day of my year to get a file, like a folder like that. I'm just like, hell yeah, let me sink my teeth into this. Bunch of palettes to paint on. Yeah, I love that, man. Like getting a full thing of beats for me is just like, I'm logging off of everything and I'm going to like have the best three weeks of my life kind of thing just writing like that's the glorious time for me so that's you know full circle to the differences between uh, my writing process with Mackie is like he sends me you know beats and like lots of beats and they're uh, sort of in a package and sort of in the same kind of vibe and yeah I write all the lyrics with Mackie the Mackie project sort of on my own on my own time and then I go into the studio and record them. And that's kind of the difference with the work with Factor. It's more like on the spot, spontaneous writing in the studio. Uh, Mackie is more like me, you know, eating a grip of mushrooms for like a week and like writing 10 songs and going over them a bunch of times and sort of like getting into a, con a really conceptual vibe. Like, mm. hence like with Yeah Riot being more of like a, quote unquote concept like not that seven vessels wasn't in the same vein as that but like yeah riot is like to me it has the same feel as like an audio book or something you know like you push play and you can listen to it from start to finish and it sort of has like a conclusion at the end and sort of a rising action and etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh yeah so long story short back to Mackie is like yeah he's been a guy that's been involved with canadian hip-hop uh an amazing producer for you know a long long time and it's just kind of like, I don't know, I feel like it's like a, a fate or a blessing to just like for me and him to start working together. He's just like really inspired me so much to work hard and just like uh, pushing my limits as, a, as an MC to like oh, just make as much art as I can. And I love that. And I've told him that, you know, I love him for that because he's like really just kept my fire burning as you know as bright as possible and that's kind of like uh for me is a blessing like uh, anyone who's like inspiring me especially like someone as dope as him and that wants to continue working with me and just like keeps feeding me more and more beats like uh you know that's the thing with Mackie and the thing with Factor is like me and Mackie have another album that's done and is going to be coming out in the not so distant future and same with Factor and it's like um that mutual working relationship with those two guys is so important to me, like as an artist. And that's kind of like, um, you know, not to be like a jerk or not that I don't want to work with anybody else, but I've like literally told both of them that they're like the only two producers that I kind of want to be working with right now. And so and they're both like, Hey, that's cool. Like, let's do it. And until I feel like, you know, that's not like going to be in the cards. Like those are kind of my, like I call them my gods. Like those guys are like dudes that are just blessing me with like inspiration. And so I'm I like literally like die for those cats. You know what I mean? That's so, awesome. Yeah. Man, to have that kind of relationship. With yeah, you guys. man, for sure. Hey, um, fuck one thing I forgot, or I, I, I forgot about the band reform party. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, when when you got back in touch after you got back from Vancouver and we were setting this up, I started to think back to Reform Party, and that was Talis on drums. Yeah, man. Is that you know, right? You yeah. know Talis? I know Talis. He yeah. was the original drummer for my band. Yeah, okay, sweet. Sparky, way back in the day. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, word. And, uh, I've seen the old posters like at Matz's or something. I think, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Levy. Mm -hmm. Levy's a good buddy of mine. We go way back. Cool, and man, yeah. Enver was in that band too, right? Yeah, yeah. Enver was a bass. Lev was like all around weirdness violin guitar uh, whatever else and yeah talus on percussion and then myself uh lyrics and you know singing rapping type of thing and yeah re reform party that's like a crazy little kind of uh crazy point you know in the last few years 
And yeah, we kind of like had a, about a year and a half run where we were, were working super hard, writing and recording all the time, jamming all the time. We were like kind of touring, uh, getting a bit of a buzz, kind of, you know, things were going up uh, well. And then there was sort of like an abrupt kind of end to that as well. So it was like... Um, this was like 2007, eight. Ah, uh, yeah. Or? What was it? I think it was like... So oh no, 2011, yeah, 12. I was gonna say, like, I think it's like 2011, 2012 type of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, right. Yeah, I was, I was looking. I I looked on Spotify. I don't think it was on there. And then I looked on Bandcamp and I found uh, found Reform Party in there. Yeah, and man. I went back. I I hadn't listened to it. Yeah, the first EP. I remember when that first came out. That pumped me up. Yeah, that was maybe it was shortly after Rage. Yeah, had, probably had they had just called it quits. Yeah, or something yeah, like that. And, and uh, you guys were like, well, that's you know, how you know. Honestly, that's how it started. It was like me like you know uh chilling one night getting a call from enver uh enver hampton who was like you know an amazing musician uh was a bass player and like one of the important like parts of the songwriters for a reform party as well and uh yeah he was like oh i'm getting together this show and i want to do this rage against the machine uh cover band and yeah i think that you'd be good for it and like yeah i mean that's you know, every fucking person in my life has told me that before. Like, oh yeah, you really sound like you know, like, yeah. I'm sorry that we Activist have the same, rapper, yeah, we have the same voice, uh, frequency, and exactly. But you know, and shout out to Zach. That's not a you know, I don't. That's no shade to him. That's oh, like no, a that's fucking a right huge blessing. But uh, so, anyways, I was like, yeah, I love Rage. Um, let's do it. And so we ended up playing a show. That's when I sort of met Talis, and I kind of. Uh, uh, I had known Levy before that as well. And uh, yeah, so we got to a point where I was like, oh, we could play this other show as this Rage Against the Machine band and we could play another show as a Rage. And I was like, okay, hey, fuck that. I don't want to like be the Rage Against the Machine cover band. I'm like, that's not dope to me. I don't want to do that. And I was like, if we're going to continue doing the band, then we need to like start writing our own songs and just be like our own band. And so that was sort of how Reform Party came about. And yeah, it was kind of like, yeah, it was an interesting time for me, man. I was like at a rough point in my life, just as far as like where I was at, um, you know, kind of like living a tr very transient life. Uh, I was like doing some K okay, the Aquanaut albums, like with an American label at that time too, and was kind of touring Europe a lot, just sort of like living all over the fucking place. And that was kind of a sort of a, an interesting moment of like my mind being sort of like um like I guess the, what I'm trying to say is like in the time when we were doing reform party it was like such a crazy time for me just like my personal life that uh that whole that whole time that we were a band is just such a fucking trip uh, cause I think we were making amazing music. We were doing such crazy things. And then it just like ended so abruptly that it, it like kind of was like a horrible breakup or something with like, a you know, you, your loved one or something like that. It was kind of just like, so once reform party was done, I like didn't want to talk about reform party. I didn't want to talk to anybody in reform party. I didn't want to like, you know, I was kind of just trying to avoid that that whole fucking situation happened. But you know, six, seven years of hindsight, I'm like, oh, that was an amazing time. We wrote some really cool shit. We did a lot of awesome stuff together. Like, and in reality, those guys like helped me like get out of a crazy rut in my personal life of just like living super unhealthy. And uh, you know, I think we made a lot of cool shit. And like, you know, if you, you know, said that uh, you know our like little EP inspired you, like you know, I, lots of other people have told me that before. Like, I, that was kind of the whole point of it is just kind of. Um, you know just to make like cool shit basically like we didn't really have any preconceived idea of like oh we're gonna like do this and this and this it was like oh let's jam like five days a week and just record it all and like let's see what the fuck kind of crazy shit we can make and yeah all those guys is if you know them they're all like diehard music people so it was like when the four of us were in like the basement together uh which is like you know the old bisonier where levy my homie levy used to live um and it's a jam space as well. We uh, we would just do like the craziest shit. You know what I mean? Like uh, I would love for like those jams to like surface sometime. Like I don't know. Yeah, reform was uh, some cool vibes. We did a lot of cool shit, but it was like a 
very intense kind of whirlwind relationship with that band and then once it ended i kind of had like a bitter taste in my mouth about it and i was kind of like fuck reform party i'm never gonna associate with reform party again i don't want to play any shows with reform party but you know the more i think about it, it like it could be pretty cool for us to like get together and play like a random ass show sometimes right but, I'm sure you guys have grown a lot since then yeah that's it you know life fucking life uh, teaches you things down the road exactly so and somehow that second ep passed me by i didn't even know that you guys put out a second one i, I just saw that on Bandcamp when i was yeah checking well it out. the reality of the situation was is like when that uh man i'm just gonna go into it fuck it uh so what happened is we'd like spent a bunch of grant money that we had got to record an album and, and tour. And by the time we had finished recording the album, uh, certain circumstances and situations took place where like the band broke up. And so basically what happened is right when that album came out, like reform party didn't exist anymore. So we didn't get a chance to tour it or even promote it. It was just kind of like, Oh, this album's done and now we're never going to play another fucking show together or that type of thing. So it like, you know, got completely slept on because we didn't do anything to tour it. Right. We did play a few shows, uh, like, you know, post kind of like a split up and it was just like, didn't seem right. So it was kind of, um, yeah, it was a shame. It was a super shame because we like put a lot into that album and it just kind of, um, kind of forgot on the wayside. And, um, you know, that's, you know, I could think like we were talking before. That's just like how how it was meant to be, yeah. and I don't question it. It's sad that it happened, and it's like I wish those guys the best. Those guys are all my bros, but in reality, it's just like what happened happened, and yeah. now it's just like a fucking side note and another step in the journey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we did a lot of cool shit. We did a lot of you know we toured a decent amount and kind of spent a lot of good time together, hanging out, and yeah, it was cool, man. It's awesome. And so you rec recently got back from Vancouver. You were living out there for a while. I was living in Vic. Oh, in Victoria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was out in Vic for about nine months. Um, yeah, it was just like a temporary kind of move out there. We, um, partner that I was with, we went out there and we're uh, just handling some business life-wise out there. Kind of just needed some time to get away from where we were. And um, yeah, I kind of just went out there and s sort of just like, uh, kicked it basically did a lot of reading a lot of writing uh, exploring and just sort of like self-reflecting and that type of thing and uh, yeah basically kind of uh, a few circumstances like brought us back to uh, back to Saskatoon and so yeah it was kind of just like a you know, not a necessarily a vacation, but just like a nice time away on the island. And so you didn't really immerse in the hip hop scene while you're out there, or did um, you take in some shows? Or? You know, I like. It's another thing is, oh shit, um, stuff doesn't burn. Oh, I'm just spilling on here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, when I got right when I moved out there, I had finished uh, coming off touring Seven Vessels. And I was kind of feeling a bit burnt out and I had actually got quite sick. I was like under the weather for, you know, a month or something like that. When I first got out there and so I, I made a commitment to taking a bit of time off music. And, you know, once that happened, um, I just sort of focused more on just like building myself as opposed to like trying to like break into a scene out there that like you know didn't really uh like i just didn't uh consciously put myself out to booking shows or anything but you know i went to like a few shows while i was out there and i did a few like a, a couple verses at like a couple different shows but yeah i had no real ambition at the time when i was out there to like try to book shows or anything like that and you know since i've been back in saskatoon like i've I was just out in Tofino and I'm going back out on tour to play out there again. So I think for me, when I was out there, I was like not trying to like force myself into any scene. Like I kind of, you know, and it might be the wrong way to think about it, but just sort of, you know, I think about, I've done enough work as far as like in Canada that I don't need to like go to like Victoria and try to like nestle myself into the right. Victoria scene. Like I've done, you know, I've, toured Canada like 10 fucking times I don't you have to like be worried about like getting my in with the niche little show spot on the corner or whatever you know type right of thing. they'll find you yeah not even that but just kind of like you know pick my poison and when I go on tour then I'll book a show I don't need to like be going out there and flexing like oh, I'm the new guy in town or yeah that type of thing so 
My dog is a that, uh, guard dog. Doug Stanhope comes to mind, the comedian. He's he, do you know Doug Stanhope? I don't know. Not familiar with him? Okay. No, he's well, a, tell he's, me about a, he's him. a renegade. He's mm-hmm. a badass. He lives in like Bisbee, Arizona. Okay. But but yeah, he's just the guy. He, he can offend the shit out of a lot of people, turn a lot of people off. He's not going to get corporate work, but but yeah, he just stuck with that kind of a rock and roll comedian, you know, two right. little clubs, and you just do it forever, and mm-hmm. you build your fans find you and like you said the thousand true fans or whatever yeah. i'm sure he's got a million by now but yeah yeah but the people that vibe with you are going to find you like yeah, yeah well, that's the thing you know, too many artists water themselves down and try to appeal to something really wide instead of just finding the people that really vibe with them yeah that's it i mean i'm like you know never i've never set my like sights on not being successful with art like yeah it would be great to be able to like you know be able to like fucking buy my parents a big ass house to live in or something like that through music yeah that would be amazing but um it's not necessarily like the complete focus for me and so yeah like being able to go on a tour in a month to go across canada is like a blessing for me and to go be able to like say i've toured europe uh you know i have people in uh europe that like you know love my music and have done shows all over the world that's all like a huge success for me and um yeah like that's kind of the thing i'm not like into the petty thinking of like trying to like make myself relevant in saskatoon every weekend by playing a show here or every month like i have to be on the bill like you know headlining or opening for some touring artist or something like that like i don't really give a fuck about that to be honest like i play like two or three shows in saskatoon a year and just because like out of necessity of like me promoting an album or something like that so like for the shows for me like you said i'm just like you know i pick my shows i play like 30 shows a year type of thing and that's usually how it goes i could be playing a lot more and touring more full time but like i'm at the point in my life now where like i like having my apartment and i like to you know uh be able to have downtime to read and write and that type of thing and like touring myself to death to like you know have my instagram page popping to me is not cool like i think that's whack and i think it's it's better to like you know have your fucking life together than it is to like say that you're living on the road because it's like if i wanted to i could book a fucking 365 day tour you know it's not a problem that i can't book shows it's just like me doing what i feel is right and like touring with artists that i think are like in the same vibe as me and sort of um you know like i like to like tour with you know, artists that I look up to and respect and like on a conscious level. And as far as like their art swag, their activist swag, um, I'm not trying to like pay fucking, um, you know, whatever, some touring band from Australia to like open up for their fucking cross Canada tour. I don't give a fuck about that. And it's not like when I see someone doing that to me, that makes me think worse of them than it does make me think that they're doing something cool, you know, like, so it's I'm on like this shit of just being like yeah creating my own little pocket of like swag and if it's like you know comes off as like being lame or insignificant then I don't really care but like yeah if we look back on like what I've accomplished through my art personally and like the things that I've done the people I've met you know the achievements that I've uh, been able to uh, you know make my way through and just like the amount of art that I've been able to release and still have my fucking mind together and be healthy and happy it's like that's like a huge blessing to me you know and like if you i used this reference uh, before with you know other conversations i've had but it's just like if i was like to write a checklist of things that i wanted to accomplish and when i was in high school like i would have accomplished all 10 by now type of thing through my art so it's like uh you know i don't see that as a bad thing you know i think it's like I feel blessed, man. So that's kind of like, I don't foresee quitting or stopping doing this because it's just like, I get to do yeah. what I love to do. It's so. satisfaction. Yeah, it's, it's not what, just put out and provide income. It's also your therapy and your creative, your yeah. art form. And yeah, it's, it's true. Just, and it, yeah, traveling, touring and like, you know, right. getting to see the world and meeting other people and kind of just like, it's a real holistic approach yeah. to living everything in one. It's not yeah. like this is my job. This is mm-hmm. where I exercise. This is when I travel, mm-hmm. when I'm on vacation and I, you know, yeah, I, I think that's like an important skill that, you know, peeps, you know, it makes life a lot better is if you can like turn like your life skills into like experiences, basically, you know what I mean? Like, um, doing things that can help you like 
achieve your goals elsewhere like you know finding a hobby or a trade or like whatever the fuck you can do that like oh you want to travel somewhere well like find a way to like do that in a way that you're gonna get paid to do that and like be able to go do it like um you know people getting you know sort of scared or fearful of the uncertainties of not like having stability all that a lot of the time can like really detract from accomplishing what you actually want to do and you know Mm -hmm. it's like liberating sometimes to not feel locked down to like security you know to be yeah um you know like yeah going out on the road for me for a month straight isn't like always the greatest move uh with just like my security in my life but it also makes me come home and appreciate what i have here as well and that type of thing and just kind of using the road and using art as just like a like a vessel basically to mm-hmm. accomplish you know what i want as is out of life and just sort of like uh creatively consciously meeting people and experiencing other cultures and history and you know what it means to be alive on earth and not like you know thinking about what it means to be alive but just like getting out there and throwing yourself into like uncertainty is like a liberating thing and if you can do that through your like passion or your art or your hobby or whatever it is then like that's fucking hella badass that's like the most radical shit you can do absolutely it's got to be nice too that you can you know, just as the artist, as the writer, the rapper, you can like focus on your thing. Like I think of guys, like some of the stuff I do for myself, I write a song, I sing, I play guitar, I record it, I mix it. I'm mm-hmm. not, you know, like, whereas you write and rap, Factor's making the beats or Mackie's making the beat, mixing it. You've got, you've got a guy that's great at artwork doing the artwork. Mm-hmm. You've got someone that's good at promotion doing the promotion. Mm-hmm. You focus on your art and then it doesn't feel like you have to escape like if you were doing that full time, just working on your music, but you're doing your own f- promo and you're doing oh, yeah. your own mixing all the time, then it would feel like, then I could see wanting to go on vacation, getting getting away from it. But when you just get to like focus on that one area of being an artist. Yeah, I think like, well, that's it. It's And, f- you know, for me too, uh, those experiences like on the road are, are what help to me creatively like as you know with yeah ride i wrote that while i was touring you know in france so it's kind of like that's an important thing for me like creatively and inspiration wise it's like you know it's tough to be inspired if you like fucking set your alarm the same time every day go work your job the same hours every day you come home do the same workout routine and fucking yeah of course you're not going to be able to inspire to like write something dope because it's like you know you're living like a fucking Nothing robot surprises yeah, you. yeah. yeah. So everything is predictable yeah that and that's it it's like you know i've you know my life has been pretty fucking crazy like all the things that i've done at up to this point in my life not just with music wise but like just you know i've had i've lived many different lives within this life and um that all contributes to like the amount of like work that i've put out as well i feel like if i was kind of just you know hanging out with the same peeps i hung out with in high school doing the same shit i used to do and kind of like you know the same old routines that are just kind of like comforting it's like um yeah then i wouldn't be where i was at and like that sometimes those decisions make you lose touch Mm -hmm. and connection with other people in your life but um you know anybody who like truly loves you and cares for you is, should understand that like if you need room to like do what you got to do to like better yourself then that's like a positive thing you know so yeah you think about death a lot you know in your lyrics it comes up a lot here yeah and there. i mean I, I, I vibe with that i find lately all the music i write is like fuck life is short fucking squeeze the juice mm-hmm. out of it you know enjoy it while you can like yeah i definitely don't like fear i don't fear death i don't um i don't think like once this my physical body is done i don't think that who i am is over either so like there's that and i'm not talking on like some catholicism shit either it's just kind of like i don't fear death i don't think that death is actually a th- uh you know well, this is gonna sound like make me sound like crazy but i don't think like death makes uh is an end uh it's just like a sort of a point of it where part of a cycle yeah the connectivity between us and this the body that we're living inside of is like that ends but i feel that consciousness and energy is always expanding and if you don't believe that like fucking study some physics like that you know the reality is the universe is uh, consistently expanding 
and same with consciousness and you know energy and for me like i've come to terms with the fact that like i feel like i've you know i've been i've lived many lives before this and in reality like I don't think I'm at a Zen level yet where I'm like going to reach some sort of like status where I'm going to, you know, you know, not exist as an energy anymore, if that makes any sense to anybody. Yeah, but you just still got karma to work out. Are you yeah, still got yeah, shit to do? Yeah, you know, like I got, you know, I'm doing the work and like I'm, you know, I'm put, I really am working to reach that level. And so for me, like uh, death is, um, death is a, a great thing. Like it's a, uh, especially if you like you know if it's on your own terms especially like that's kind of the biggest injustice for me is when like it isn't on your own terms and like Mm -hmm. that's kind of like where a lot of my activism comes from is just sort of uh that approach of just sort of like um yeah not fearing death because like um the reality is is like you probably um are going to get another shot at it you know and like the test that you're dealing with this time around is like that's all it is it's just a test for the next time how you react to it how you uh you know how, how you sort of respond to challenges that you face and and like you know thinking about taking the burden off this life is thinking about things that have happened to you in previous lives and that type of thing like i think that all is a humbling way of you know, not being fearful to like stand up for what you believe in and like things that you're passionate about because it's like, you know, thinking of time as like being, oh, I'm so limited in my time in this life. Like that's a, that's a, that's a hard way to live. And like, um, rather than being in fear of that, like maximizing the time that you have when you're able to express as yourself, like that should be the focus. Like death is, just a temporary phase like right you know it's coming yeah so it, that's it and it's like it, no? and you know not thinking of it as an end just thinking of it as like a chapter in a book of yeah. like the conscious fucking bible yeah. or whatever it what is what do you want to get like, done before the end of the day yeah that's it and so for me like i heard a cool a cool quote and i you know i'm probably gonna be it'll be like lame when i when i say it now but it was like something along the lines of like you know everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die and i like i I, when i heard that i was like man that's fucking so dope like (laughs) i think it's true you know what i mean like people would be much happier i think if they just like focused on the reality that like yeah you're so you know this moment right now is is a fucking special moment and to uh, take advantage of it don't sit around and like waste your fucking time doing things that don't make you happy focus on things that you're passionate about things that you love doing things that you think contribute to the world and the conscious world is a positive way and fucking do that as much as you can and like uh, i think that comes back sort of like what we were talking about before is just like you know surrounding yourself and putting yourself in an environment where you're um okay with that and like taking advantage of you know the moment like in reality because like the future is going to be there and the past is there as well but like you can only control right now type of thing so yeah it's really all there is yeah it's it's cheesy to say but all there is is the moment yeah i mean that's it i feel like this you know this interview is going to make me sound insane but yeah i've been like doing a lot of like uh you know been lifting a lot of like heavy weights mentally the last like year a few years and just a lot of reading self-reflecting and sort of just a a paradigm shift i feel is just sort of like my perspective of life and existence and how old are you uh well i don't necessarily want to put that out on there but (laughs) you know i'm old enough to to, you know infinite yeah i'm exactly (laughs) i've i feel like i've said it in tracks before i've like lived like 20 or 25 lives i feel or something like that so probably like what does that work out to you two thousand i hear that man. <laughs> now i'm i'm 36 and i'm like i don't know in these last few years like life just gets more and more introspective raising kids too it's like i'm reliving these ages like my daughters are eight and eleven and it's like right. every year they they grow it's like i'm reliving these ages and just oh, that's take a trip. New, new perspective on my own no that's a yeah. trip I, I like you know i don't have children myself and, and it's not that i have consciously not you know chose to not have kids but just the way that the world has like led me so far i don't have any children but uh, i love kids and like yeah i i I always think that i'm like man it must be such a like trip to just you know like obviously the parental love is just like something that happens but i think a lot of that love too comes from just like seeing yourself like in these peeps where you're just like man like i have to take care of this (laughs) you know like 
Uh, I think it's that's a beautiful that's thing. Man, yeah. There are so many amazing experiences to have in this lifetime, and that's yeah, that's that's one of them. Definitely. But yeah, with that, there's a give and take. You know, you you give away your kind of right to take off and travel and yeah, yeah, do well, whatever you want all the time. That's and, true. You that's know. true. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, if you didn't pr- pursue music, what would you pursue? Are you like, is there anything else you're like? Uh, art well, do you, like, yeah. do, you, do paints or anything yeah or you... i mean i've done you know i have like a couple i mean that painting right there is like a one that i did and i you know i've used to spent like many you know i've painted a decent amount in my life and i've uh you know my main focus is like in the next few years i feel honestly other than like um rap shit is that like i, I want to be a published author right away i've been like working on some stuff the last little bit as well and, um, yeah, I like, you know, I see myself, you know, as like an author kind of thing. Like I, I said that before, like I, I look at a lot of my albums as like novels or stories and, and I've kind of am working towards that. And I feel like I'm getting into that age now where like a lot of authors that I've looked up to, like have sort of started their journey as, as authors as well. And I'm assuming they were probably doing a lot of the same shit that I was doing like just not rap wise but probably pursuing writing in some you know writing editorials or you know newspapers or whatever the but just sort of finally focusing and being like um the all these stories that I've been sort of building through my life experiences and things that I've been thinking about over the past few years I've like finally you know invested in the technology that's like helping me to actually write and uh uh, yeah, so like I'm gonna say it right now. Like in the next, I'm gonna say three to five years, I'm I want to have a book published and like uh, yeah, kind of just like work towards um, doing what I'm doing with my rap shit and doing that as far as like books as well. So like yeah. that's kind of my focus as I, the older I get is uh, you know I want to be writing and publishing a, a whole whack of shit coming up. So. It's dope, man. Mm. What would you just like speed around here, kind of bringing it home? Yeah. Um, what would you tell 18 year old K? Damn. Um, 18 year old me, what would I say? That's interesting. That's a good question. Um, I would say, yeah, damn, man, that's a good one. Um, I think I would tell him that, like, uh, you know, everything that you're, like, focusing on, like, everything that you desire to do is what you should do. And don't think that, like, what your societal group or, like, your environment, people around you sort of, like, like, be true to yourself, not to the identity that you, like, somehow created in high school like you know where you're sort of like right you know trying to live up to something that you're not actually that and the things that you do in that a representation of you make you feel bad and don't like and build you know. up a certain persona to yeah. deal with the reality of existing yeah trusting that like how you feel when you're like by yourself and with your family is like a healthy positive way and the way that you feel elsewhere when you're you know things are doing and happening that you don't feel uh, you know so good about like just sort of uh you know self-belief i guess like trusting your own thoughts and instincts exactly uh passion yeah don't you know you know uh just be smart with the people that you surround yourself with i think too like you know yeah that's huge man i think there's a lot of people that have you know friends or even even family members and especially with family members i think it's extra hard to to let them go or to, you know, not be around them if they're not serving you. Yeah. Oh, some yeah. people like, I'm really lucky. My family's get along with everybody in my family, but I know some, some friends who just can't stand being around. Oh yeah. It's dad or the brother oh, or whatever it is. And, like, yeah. That's, uh, you they know, don't serve you though. It's, I feel like that's the thing with like, especially with artistic shit too, man. Like if you think about how many people's like dreams have been crushed by like their, someone in their family like talking shit about what they do artistically or like oh you shouldn't play in a band like why would you ever you can't make any money painting paint pictures or you know like you're you know i think that's a big thing and like you know even people like talking throwing shade about like going on the road or whatever like you know certain 
certain people don't like to see you win and that can be people in your family as well and so you know yeah, family yeah. is family but it's like also important to acknowledge like having good people around you who are going to support you no matter what your uh, choices are obviously if they're you know obviously if choices that are related to pursuing art and you yeah know, that type of thing seems like a pure way to do things you know just look for what's nurturing you just yeah go for the aim for the sunlight yeah. i think so you know what i mean like trust trust your guts man like i don't yeah. know too many people like if you had a a billboard like that everybody could see in saskatoon or in the world you know just like one message like one sentence that you could put out there what would it be yeah i think it's a uh, just the first thing that t- comes to my head is like a quote from like an oliver stone movie uh platoon where it's like a uh, dude just says like fr- you free your mind and your ass will follow and i feel <laughs> like that's like powerful but very totally truthful like you know you are what you tell yourself that you are and if you can liberate yourself from like your preconceived ideas of what you're supposed to be or who you are or who other people think you are and just be who you are then like your body's gonna follow that you know like your mind is what's you know well there are people that you know obviously there's a lot of things related to your gut and like the way the gut affects the brain but in reality like having conscious thoughts about like changing your life in a positive yeah. way that works. And like, if you believe it, then it's going to happen. And Good like, time. if you don't believe me, then show me otherwise. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. What makes you laugh? What, what do you find funny? Uh, you know, I have like a pretty, I don't know. Is it egotistical to say that I have a good sense of humor in myself? Like, I don't know. I feel like I have a, I'm a pretty funny dude. I, I like to joke around and, uh, you know, I grew up with, you know, two older brothers and I grew up sort of in like sports environment when I was younger. So, I mean, like I like, you know, razzing and all that other good shit too. But like, yeah, for me, um, in this day and age, like I like kind of stupid, my like one guilty pleasure is like dumb comedy. Like I like, you know, the latest Will Ferrell movie. I probably will put that on and just like laugh to myself about it. You know, like, I don't know. And I like, uh, kind of like i you know i'm a big fan of the office like the british version as well and, and like the american version as well i also love but i also like kind of like uh dry british humor as well there's a series called people just do nothing that i like watched quite a bit like a year ago and uh like watched it on repeat basically I, and you know like just kind of like shit that makes me think about my own life that I can like you know, people put in a humorous perspective like you know anyone who works a job can relate to the office in a sense and find like similarities between shit that's happened in their own life and yeah like my humor is uh you know pretty slapstick I guess they call it uh that type of thing but yeah, yeah. yeah. and I like you know storytelling uh people who I like to hang out with peeps who can tell great stories and you know like I like to uh, you know, laugh in person with people and stuff like that. But, you know, like uh, you were mentioning uh, comedians and stuff like that before. I do love uh, stand-up comedy, but I'm just like, I, I don't, you know, I don't see enough of it. I got to like search that out more, I think, because, I mean, I know that's like a popular thing right now on like the streaming services and stuff. So like the access is there. But yeah, I love stand-up comedy as well, too. I always felt like I wanted to do stand-up comedy myself, like, but, you know, I've never wrote any jokes or anything, but I feel like that'd be a fucking fun thing to do, like, yeah, no, e- every now and then type of thing, so. I think half of it is how you carry yourself, yeah. so you've already got that, yeah, yeah. and then it's just, you know, just putting the material together. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think I Yeah, there's, the there's a out lot out there now. That's, mm-hmm. It's a hot wave, and that's that's a big push behind podcasting, I think, is coming from comedians Mm -hmm. in the comic community and there's so many different flavors out there yeah 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 everybody yeah i mean that's true like a lot of comedians have their own podcast now yeah that's a great way to just connect with the fans and yeah find the people that vibe with you like specifically like there's so many guys that i'm just like just i just listen to this guy talk and he's fucking hilarious Yeah. (laughs) yeah some of them are funnier just talking than their comedy is to me oh yeah totally you guys um, so man, just taking it home, um, uh, just a couple, couple artists that you like grew up on or that are totally instrumental to you and a couple new artists for people to check out. Uh, 
like just any artist in particular or like spe- like related to like rap music yeah, i guess like first of all just just any in particular yeah. just just like a couple artists that were like yeah. in your fabric that yeah like if we're thinking like musical artists like i think for peeps that have had a big effect on me growing up uh like Jimi hendrix was probably my favorite all-time artist i think i grew up my pops like had a pretty awesome record collection growing up and so i listened to like a ton of H- hendrix growing up and uh, yeah i love Jimi hendrix i don't know his music to me like i can just even put it on like now uh almost every album that he's put out uh old catalog his like you know more leading up to his passing catalog as well it's just so powerful to me i like a lot of the concepts the lyrics and just the feel of the music it's like um stuff that just sort of shaped me emotionally almost like you know you hear certain songs and it just makes you feel a certain type of way as if you've experienced it before like that's just like the connectivity of his art to me like it just made sense and so hendrix i mean shit he's like he's the top of the line for me if you don't fuck with hendrix i'm kind of like thinking you know <laughs> i'll look at you kind of crooked type of things so, um so nice. H- yeah hendrix, i haven't listened to him forever i'm gonna listen to him on the yeah, way home yeah, no, tonight. hendrix right. is my shit That's always cool. uh he's my number one and then um uh, you know i have a lot of like number twos as well, uh, well but i think like just uh, i think out of respect right now like I'm, i've been you know I, i'm a big tom york guy i always loved radiohead growing up and i just like kind of love their sort of indie swag and the way that uh, he carried himself as an artist and sort of just kind of keeping his sort of creepy but super intelligent sort of swag and just sort of, you know, always being in the limelight but never in the limelight type of thing and, you know, always kind of speaking out and making people think with his art, you know. It's not like Mm -hmm. um, you can listen to, like, a a Radiohead album and know exactly what every song means, but it'll at least make you think about it. And I always loved his lyrics because it's, like, very just fragmented thoughts and like that to me is like an important thing with like even the artists that are the sorry the literature that i read is like i like artists uh authors and artists that sort of you know bounce in between ideas and stuff like that that sort of challenge my uh, perspective of like what that what is he talking about what is the message trying to like uh same with hendrix i feel like uh tom york and jimmy like kind of had that they have that same vibe of like really being able to relate through their lyrics but also like there's a lot of uncertainty to the, to the lyrics where you're like is there a deeper meaning to what he's saying and um i think just yeah for me i i see a, a lot of similarities in just like my personality with tom york as well so i'd say tom york Jimi hendrix and then if i was like gonna pick a number three as far as uh yeah, uh, I guess rap rapping goes. I'll, I'll pick an MC that like really inspired me. Um, I mean, there's so many of them, but uh, I'd say like for like growing up wise, you know, someone who really like pushed me. You know, you know, it's tough to say. I, I'm gonna just go with the go to. Like, there's like a you know crew of, of rappers uh, from like Los Angeles underground '90s hip hop group called uh, Freestyle Fellowship. It's like, you know, Mike and Nine, AC Alone, uh, Self Jupiter, and Peace. It kind of like led a wave of, you know, sort of really stylistic, jazz inspired hip hop. Um, and so, you know, all those guys kind of collectively really like pushed the borders of me, like thinking about like, you know, making art as an instrument, as, as a lyricist, and sort of like speaking to people through the music um, in a way that's still cool and like has a dope uh, style to it and just sort of like interconnecting consciousness with like uh, like uh, fun rhythms and fun vibes and that type of thing so yeah i would say like freestyle fellowship tom york um Jimi hendrix those are my top three just off the top of my head if Radiohead you, was huge for that. They were the first ones to do the pay what you want. Yeah. Like rainbows. Like that. I think that thing, you know, that's the type of shit I'm talking about. The way that they carry themselves, they like, you know, they put out the Kid A album. It fucking went crazy big. Then they pulled away from like the industry and bought their own studio, took all their, bought all their own masters. They took all their 
uh, you know, they took control over themselves and started doing their own independent hustle. And they're still putting out amazing music, you know, pay what you want before anyone else was even doing that type of shit. And just sort of like, you know, being ahead of the curve uh, style wise, you know, and just as an approach as an artist in like a human, human, like a very human way, like um, not an elitist type of way, you know, where you're like, uh trying to be something that they're not i think radiohead is just like normal ass dudes that just love making cool art and like i think it comes through and uh yeah much love to radiohead man Uh, a funny story is like i was i had tickets to see them in toronto a few years back and on the way to the show we were on the subway and found out that uh Oh, yeah, it's all good. Found out that the stage had collapsed and someone had passed away at the show. And so the show got canceled. And that was like the last time I had a, like, you know, I was so close to seeing them, but didn't happen. And so they like recently, I think this year, did like the show back in Toronto and like made amends basically for the dude's life that he he passed away. But yeah, um, I will see Radiohead at some point before the, you know, before I pass or they pass that type of thing. So I saw him once in like 2007, Mm -hmm. eight, it was in uh, at Thunderbird stadium in Vancouver outside and it was fucking magical. Oh yeah. I bet. Damn. (laughs) Were you psyched out or what? Um, yeah, we'd, we'd eaten some mushrooms on the way and it was funny because we're getting ushered in there and we had some mushrooms and we're wondering like, you know, should we eat them now? Should we wait till we get in there? And we thought, well, it'll be a while till they kick in. So we'll eat them now. And they had us corralled like animals, like in between <laughs> gates, like we're waiting from this gate to this gate to get searched. So we're in there. And meanwhile, you know, 40 minutes later, you're starting to feel it and mm-hmm. people are waiting to frisk oh, you and stuff like best. that. Yeah. We got in there. It was, it was magical. I, I forget who the opener was, but Radiohead walked to the, walked up to the stage. Tom York walked up. Um, the crowd starts cheering and oh no, it started to rain about 10 seconds before nice. he walked out and yeah. just said, we radio head and we brought the rain. <laughs> and we're from the UK and we brought the rain. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, I guess that was the, uh, was that the hill to the thief tour. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, I fucking love that album. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, that's yeah, the man. thing. It's like, and that's the, I think a, you know, beautiful thing about Radiohead too, is like all their albums, uh, have such a special like place for me they're not like you know i don't think one's better than the other you know they're all great and they all it's hard to compare them they all mean (laughs) things like different things to me so i'm like you know even the first few albums like the more poppy shit i'm like oh man these are beautiful songs and and then yeah you like put on hail to the thief or whatever and you're like you know, you're hearing certain tracks that, you know, you're just like, holy fuck, this was a hit way ahead I know, this, this was the In Rainbows tour. Hail oh. to the Thief, I remember having a listening party when Hail to the Thief first came out at the old Sparky house. Oh, yeah. Just not far from here, 7th Avenue. And uh, Levy was there for sure. There was a mm. few of us sitting in the garage in the dark, listening <laughs> to it straight through, just with the bong going around. Yeah, that's sick. And it was magical, man. Hell, yeah. Yeah, and what about just a couple like new artists, yeah, or artists um, that people might not know about that you think shit, you give man, a shout to, um, people should check out? Yeah, I mean, they're like, I'll just like talk to some artists like that I really love and that I feel like don't get a lot of shine um, in Canada. My and I'm going on tour with this guy in October of this year, 2018. Uh, his name's Lee Reed. He's uh, he's a rapper from Hamilton. And uh, he was originally in a band called Warsaw Pact way back in the day. He was the lead vocalist. And he, yeah, they were like a pretty cool ass like group that uh, did a lot of cool shit like in the 90s. And um, he's a fucking phenomenal rapper. He's one of the best writers I've ever come across. And like, you know, I'm a pretty like, I don't want to say judgy about it, but like, yeah, I'm pretty like critical with bars. Like if I... I can enjoy your music and think you suck at rapping in the same sense, you know, type of thing. But, like, for a a dude like uh, Lee Reed, like, I enjoy his music and his lyrics and delivery and his bars and his writing are all just, like, mind-blowing to me. Like, I hear his shit and I'm just, like, I've, you know, he inspires me and he's, like, a very good homie of mine. He's a mentor and I've toured with him a lot in the last few years and he's going to be dropping a new album. I think it's going to be on Stone's Throw. Uh, which is Sage Francis's uh, like offshoot, and 
yeah, so Lee Reed uh, out of Hamilton, crazy, amazing rapper. He's uh, one of my favorites. And, um, you know, anytime I, if you need a little angsty, you know, a little angst in your diet, like put some Lee Reed on and, uh, yeah, he's fucking amazing. So Lee I'll Reed for that. Yeah. Check him out for really sure. And I'm sure we played with Warsaw pack as soon as you said that. In yeah. Your, like you I said mean, they're from Hamilton. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, I don't know if they must, I, I think Warsaw was based out of Hamilton too. Yeah. Like Lee's okay. in Hamilton and I believe Warsaw was based out of Hamilton as well. That's and, so um, familiar. Yeah, they played Saskatoon tons, man. So you guys probably uh, played with them, I'm assuming. Yeah, like, I remember the name. I can picture their logo even. I think it's like a Chaos Star or whatever. Or something. I don't know. I can't remember the I logo, be to be honest. Up. But um, shit, I could, you know, he would, I guarantee Lee would uh, know. So I'll ask him okay. definitely. But yeah, uh, Lee Reed. Um, yeah, and then I mean like. I don't know. Is it whack to me to say factor? Like, I feel like factor chandelier. I don't know. It's like, I've been thinking about that lately. Like, um, I like run into some people who are like, you know, around my age who are like, Oh, you know, I've lived, I've never seen you perform before. And I'm like, you've literally lived in Saskatoon your whole like 30 some years. And like, you've never seen a fucking K the Aquanaut or factor chandelier show. I'm like, to me, that's fucking weird. And if you have lived in Saskatoon or you're in the area or if you're wherever you're listening and you haven't heard of Factor Chandelier, he's one of the fucking premier uh, musicians slash producers slash creative minds uh, in the Saskatoon history, I feel like. Literally, he's on a level of, you know, uh, God level here. And if you don't know his shit, or even if you know who he is and you just don't listen to his shit because you, you know, don't want to, like, I feel like people need to start giving props where props is due. And, um, you know, Factor is, like, on some legendary shit. And just because you know him or you don't know him, um, doesn't take away from the fact that like he's an incredible artist and like he needs to be getting way more love, uh, not only in Saskatoon but in Canada and in the world. And so yeah, if you don't know Lee Reed, check his shit out. If you're from Saskatoon and you don't know Factor, fucking shame on you. And if you do know who he is and you've never like checked his shit out, you should because he's literally like you know. Uh, inspiring probably all the peeps that you do look up to so yeah, you guys have been inspiring just following you both last last year or two just watching just how prolific you guys are and yeah like the quality and the quantity of stuff at yeah thanks. the same time and just the consistent grind like yeah i appreciate that i feel like and you know i feel like the same and I'm like the third one i'll say is like yeah myself if you like haven't uh checked my my music out or like if you've heard of who i am and have never listened to my music before um you know give it a shot and like come out to a hip-hop show if you see k the aquanaut on the bill and like check me out what i'm doing um yeah i feel like i've been putting in a lot of work for like you know myself most importantly but like also like saskatoon wise and you know i feel I, i'm uh you know an important part of like what's been happening here as far as like uh hip hop wise goes and you know if you're like a young kid who's into rap music or hip hop music and you like you know want to chat to someone with like how to fucking get your music out or like to go on a tour or play a show outside of fucking Saskatoon or something like that like you know hit me up like i i uh yeah i feel like um I got a lot to offer as far as just like on some mentorship or like just sort of uh, someone's mind to pick. And if you like live in Saskatoon or in the surrounding area and you've never checked my shit out and you're like here in this interview for the first time, then like, yeah, like where have you been A and B? Like, yeah, check it out. Get in line yeah. with like... Uh, where, where can people find you so they can find out when you're playing? Yeah. Socials and stuff. Yeah, social media. I mean, I like I'm not crazy prolific on the social media, but I'm on, uh, you know, Instagram once or twice a week kind of thing posting i do i'm on uh, twitter i'm on facebook and then yeah if you're like looking to the like, support uh musically Bandcamp or um for purchasing and then if you're just like into streaming i'm on all like the major streaming sites so whether you're rocking with uh 
Spotify, Spotify or iMusic or, or whatever it is. Yeah, fucking uh, <laughs> Google Music or whatever it is. Like, uh, it should be on that shit. And if it's not on there, like, uh, yeah, please let me know because it should be. Uh, so, yeah. And Reach yeah, out. an important thing is to uh, check out just what's coming up in the future. I like literally um, feel like I have my hottest, best new stuff coming out right away. And um, I'm just about to go on tour in October across Canada and coming back and just going to be like exciting things for 2019. So more to come. Yeah, more to come for sure. So yeah, check out my man Lee Reed, check out Factor and check out K the Aquanaut if you if you haven't heard my shit, uh check it out. Right on. Yeah, man. man thanks for having me in your place. Yeah. Doing this, man. I appreciate it, bro. Thanks for having me yeah. on, man. Peace. Hell yeah, hell yeah. And there you have it, episode 17 with K the Aquanaut. That's at Aquanaut Music on Instagram, K the Aquanaut on Twitter. Check out his tour. It's happening right now as you're listening to this. This Saturday, October 6th at the Black Cat in Saskatoon. Don't miss the show. Thank you again for joining me. Reach out if you have anything to say, questions, or comments. Conjecturetime at gmail.com. Tell your friends. And join us next week or the week after for episode 18 with Christian Zrimiak. Christian is the founder of Float Now in Saskatoon. He's responsible for bringing float tanks, sensory deprivation tanks to Saskatoon as well as Regina. He's the mastermind behind that. And uh, he's also a student of magic and neurolinguistic programming. And we had a very interesting conversation you will not want to miss. Thank you again for joining me. I love you all.